Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's worship God together. Breathe, we 
by your love I am accepted Your good and gracious gift Oh, what grace that you would see me As your child secure in you forever I pour out my praise again You deserve the greater glory Overcome I lift my voice To the King in need of nothing Empty handed I Good morning, everyone, and it's so good to see so many faces and some new faces. So if you are new today, we welcome you, and we thank you for coming and worship with us on this beautiful day. Um, so we have a couple of announcements. We have today is Communion Sunday, and also Pastor Fidel, before, um, before uh, he begins his message today, will share a presentation of last year's mission so that uh, we have an understanding of what uh, the, our missionaries are going to be going, uh, are going to be doing this summer. Um, so that's for the announcements. And what, uh, while we were worshiping, I was thinking about the eclipse <laughs> and, and the spiritual comparison to how dangerous it is to allow the darkness to overrule the light in our life, just like what will happen when the moon covers the sun. If you look at it, it, will co it can cause blindness. And the same way, if we allow darkness to come into our lives, 
it will blind us spiritually. God creates things in order for us to understand in the natural and in the spiritual. It is beautiful. Yeah. Um, so those are for the announcements. Um, for prayers today, uh, yeah. Hi, I just want to say something so that you can worship a little bit while you're seeing the eclipse. So, um, if you see it, so the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, and the so it's gonna the moon is gonna be perfect over the sun so like it could have been just a teeny bit over could have been over too big to cover it's exact so as you're thinking about that eclipse you can worship god knowing that what an incredible designer so right in that little bit it yeah to like right that one little concept to me Proves that evolution did not. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Um, so, though, so for prayers, I didn't receive any prayer requests today, but maybe we have some. Yes, thank you, Linda. Linda was telling me that on her way to church today, she saw an accident at the corner of uh, Fraser and principal, and it was quite a significant uh, accident. There was also a bus parked right there. It was an SUV, <clears throat> and the SUV's front was all dented in. So, and there was a bus parked on the other side. So was it a bus accident? We don't know. But it's on Linda's heart that we should pray for that. There was an ambulance and all sorts of first responders that were there. Um, so that's for prayer. Any other prayer requests? Um, yes? For your roommate? She has dementia. He. Okay. What's his name? Paul. Well, he has a, a, a name and a half, we could say. So maybe you could remind him that there are no coincidences in Christ for those who trust in him. Kim. Kim, Paul, and Karen. Surgery went well. They removed their kidney. Okay. Okay. So they've removed the kidney. They're doing biopsy to see if there was any cancer there. So for, for Scott's and Karen. And the next step forward. Yes. All right. I don't know if I'll remember all that. <laughs> Just have mercy on me this morning, yes? <laughs> Dorothy? Okay. Karen, Paul, Kim, Dorothy. <laughs> Mike, Karen, Paul, Dorothy, Kim, and Paul. And Paul and? <laughs> Mike. Mike. God, you know all of them. <laughs> all right. I feel like uh, this is a memory game. All right. God bless them. Father God, we come to you today with an expectant heart. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your guidance today, for your presence in us, because we know the mind on its own does not understand but with the Spirit, the eyes open to the mysteries of God. So through your Holy Spirit today, Lord God, teach us and bring us nearer to you that we may be in your presence in the throne room of God himself. By the great sacrifice of Jesus' death, the curtain was opened up to us. And now we can, we can clearly and boldly come to the throne of grace and in your presence today, we come, Lord God, and we worship you. We thank you for this, Lord God. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. And we, Lord, we lift up all of the prayer requests that have been laid before you right now, Lord God. 
We thank you, Lord, for this accident that occurred today and whoever was involved in it, O oh Lord, that your hand of mercy would be upon them and their lives may be spared, Father God, and your healing may be one that comes from above and supernatural as all things come from you. And Lord, that this may be a way for them to know you and to see through you. I fought not to see through you, but see through your eyes, rather. I, Father, I thank you for the requests that have been laid here today. I would like to, to pray for, um, for now I'm remember, and I'm not going to remember all this, uh, for our sister's roommate uh, who has Alzheimer. And I thank you, Lord God, that you touch this person and that you heal the brain. As well, oh Lord God, in the same category, I'd like to continue to pray for Mike. All those who are affected with ne neurological issues, Lord God, you are the one who has the manual of instruction. And so we lay it at your feet and we thank you, Lord, that you heal in the name of Jesus, by your blood, Lord Jesus. We'd like to pray for, for, for Dorothy and to continue, Lord God, to heal her. I would like to pray for... Now, thank you, Lord God, that you continue to pray for all the requests for Kim. And um, would you remind me the names? Karen. Yes, thank you, Lord, for continue, to continue to pray. We continue to pray for Karen as uh, she is in this waiting time, Lord God, to know if the, the, the operation will end there. And Lord, so we continue to pray that by your name, by your stripes, she is healed in the name of Jesus. There is no cancer. And we command this cancer away from her body, not to enter it in the name of Jesus, for there to be a good report, and that they will, she will be completely healed and restored in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I pray for the service today. And I thank you, Lord God, that you have your way in this message through Pastor Fidel and thank you, Lord God, that we may come at the throne of grace today to receive this. And I would like to read um, a scripture for you from the book of Isaiah. It's uh, chapter 28, uh, verse 16. So this is what the sovereign, Lord, the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie, and water will overflow your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. So we thank you, Lord God, that sometimes through the hail and through the storm, God, God comes in and he takes us out of our refuge, the lie. There we were hiding before we know him. And then sometimes through the storm, there is where he finds us. So we are reminded that the good and the bad oftentimes are for his glory. So... So now we would like two children, okay? Two, Zion and, okay, come. So um, also we have, Enya has, um, has put in the back some coloring books and some, uh, some, uh, some crayons. So for parents who have little ones, if they wish to attend and they're too young to go downstairs, or anyways, this is a wonderful thing that Adina has uh, brought to us. Okay, so let's pray for the offering. Father, we thank you for all that you give to this church. I thank you for those who give, that you bless them. And I pray, Lord God, for every penny that is given to us in the prayers. Pray, I thank you that you multiply them and that you use them for your great will in the name of Jesus. Amen.
So if, it's your, if it is your first time today, um, we have uh, uh, at that table there um, a place where you can sign in your email and Pastor Fidel will love to reach you and uh, connect with you during the week. Okay, we'll dismiss the, ch oh, do we dismiss the children or first we do the presentation? And we have the, 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 so we don't dismiss the children yet. And we have the communion, yes. Okay, so we won't dismiss you yet. You can go back to your seats. We're going to take communion and then you'll go to Sunday school. focus on Jesus. You know that one? What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your blood. Nothing else. Does everyone have um, the emblem? So let us open and um, partake of the body of Jesus Christ. He said, my food, my body is real food. And my blood is real drink. So if you have it, let us partake. is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fountain I know nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the In Christian theology, there is this um, discussion. When we take the communion, is Jesus really there? 
The Catholic Church believes that that drink turns into real, real blood. And that, um, that piece of bread or whatever it is, it turns into real body. But the, the Protestants, we believe in the spiritual presence behind the emblem. Just the way he is present in the water as we get baptized, he is right there. We're not eating the real meat and the blood, but God is right there. So if you haven't taken the, the drink, you can open and just be aware of him that approaches, that you will approach as we partake and remember his blood on the cross. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me. That makes me white as snow No other fountain I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus His blood was shed over 2,000 years ago Yet to this day it's still taking away our sin. That's the mystery of the cross. Amen. All right, so I would like, uh, I want to show you a presentation right now. Um, those of you who know, I come from Rwanda, and um, we have a ministry that goes in East Africa. Uh, and this year, we're going to go back. And it is so far five of us from this church who are going to be going. And uh, so we want to introduce to you about into the mission so that we are all on the same page because we need your prayers. And when the church is praying, souls can be saved. And we also need your money. <laughs> because it costs a lot of money to do this. So this is last year. I went alone. Uh, so I want to go show you what happened last year so you know the kind of thing we do when we go. So that was one of the meetings I held. Um, if you can see there was not enough space for people to sit on chairs. They had to take the chairs out, and people are sitting next to each other on the mats. Next one. So I went uh, June 4th to June 22nd. You know, when I go, the hero is my wife, who stays with the kids. <laughs> Yeah, uh, see, that's a long time, the, the 4th to the 22nd, and uh, my mother-in-law comes and she helps out, and the church also, you know, many people were coming and visiting, bringing some meals. So I held 12 meetings, and I uh, went to Rwanda and Uganda, and uh, 350 people got saved. <clears throat> 
And you see a little bit of a clip uh, later, hopefully, of me praying for them. So next one. So our ministry is in East Africa. We have what we do. God, I read the scripture in Isaiah. God says, you are my witness that people should know that I alone am God. So I want people to know God. The ministry is called the Knowing God Missions. So we teach about the nature of God. And my commission really is for East Africans, maybe we're going to expand to whole Africa, for them to have the correct doctrine in their own mother tongues. So now what I'm preaching today is going to be translated in Kenya, Rwanda, Kilundi, Kiswahili, and Luganda. So they're going to be all going to be learning about the Holy Spirit. So we are in a few countries. That, last year, I had a, a crusade in Uganda with that pastor. Um, and what is amazing, you see all those faces? Those are evangelists. I went to Kigali in Rwanda, and I found 30 of them waiting for me. We went into a bus. We crossed over to Uganda together. And we, they were in the streets preaching and inviting people, and we heard the crusade at the end. Next one. So that's the bus as we are leaving Rwanda, going to Uganda. Next one. So that's uh, crusade day one. Um, you know, when I'm there, I feel alive. I feel like anything is possible, and truly, God is true to his word. When he says... I will be with you. He really does go with us. So that was one of the evenings that we were doing the crusade. Next one. Okay. So these were the people who had just got saved. I was praying for them and uh, telling them that now they don't have to be afraid. They don't have to remain in their sins. So you see, I prayed for each one of them, 350. And then they will bring them on the other side. Amen. So I am saying, enter. Enter into Christ. It's safe. You can come. And they took them all, they wrote their names, so we can continue to disciple them. All right, so next one. So it's, uh, yeah, so these are some of the photos as we're praying for others. And this, um, go back a little bit. Those evangelists who went with me, they were in the streets. So this is their work, in the streets also preaching. Next one. Yeah, that's the same photo. Next. So, um, the part of what we do, we create discipleship groups in churches and in schools, in hospitals, workplaces, wherever they allow us to go. We, have, we create discipleship groups, and when I go, they try to come together and I meet them. So this was a group of students who uh, have a discipleship group in their school. And um, whenever I see a baby, I think of my own babies. <laughs> so the next one. Uh, so um, this what, what, is in the east of Rwanda, where, where I was born. People come in bigger numbers uh, to, to hear the word of God. Next one. So this is a video, I, I wasn't able to, to give it to you, but this is where we're gonna go. Those who, who are here, who are thinking of going, stand up, if you are here and you are praying about going with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that is the place where we're gonna go. It's a refugee camp. Uh, when I get there, my brothers and sisters, they are so hungry for God, but they are so poor. They are refugees. Some of them run with nothing. And with the COVID and the wars in, the Euro in Europe, the United Nations refugee 
uh, organization has reduced the amount of help they give to refugees. So when I go, I gather them together, and there, I had everyone hold hand, so they know that although I live in Canada, that we are the same, and we love each other. So we did a prayer together, and it was a huge, huge number of people. I was telling them, you can see, I, I, I'm almost crying, because I feel their heart. Next, next slide. Okay, so, Another thing we do that we're going to do again, we bring all the leaders from those in Congo, those in Burundi, those in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. I bring them in, in Rwanda, all of them, and we did a, a leaders' conference. See, I washed their hands, their feet. See the middle picture? I didn't know what it's going to take to, watch, to wash the feet of 100 people. <laughs> I was kneeling down. After number 30, my knees were hurting. But I washed their feet just to show them that to be a leader is to serve. And we had three days in one place. I was teaching them about the five pillars of the church, that we have to know the Father and his love. We have to know the Holy Spirit and his power. We have to know the Son and His Word. And we have to know the church, love the church and love the world. Next. And these are some of the leaders. So we commission them, those who are going to start discipleship groups in their countries. Um, some are going to Burundi, Uganda, um, Tanzania, Kenya. When I was in, in uh, Kenya last month in March, this guy was there with me. He traveled from Uganda to come and meet me in Kenya. Next one. So they gave me gifts. <laughs> so they gave me an umbrella. Yeah, that God will protect me. And uh, a shepherd's rod. That was the time when I was praying about accepting this position to be a pastor here. So they brought, they say, we feel this is your gift. So when I received that, I think it's a Pastor Joe who wrote to me, he said, that is an answer for you. You are to be a shepherd. So next one. Uh, if you go back a little bit, uh, the, this couple, they, they are our coordinators in East Africa. They coordinate all these countries, all the activities we do. So we, we have a mandate from the, the we, we are a registered ch charity. So we are registered with, with CRA, and we are allowed to preach the gospel. We are allowed to reduce poverty, uh, and also to have scholarships. So Gloria and uh, her husband, they help us coordinate all that. It takes a lot of money, but a lot of people give to help us. Next one. So when I go, so people get saved and we baptize them. Um, that lady, she came down to be baptized and she was attacked by demons. Right there, she lost her breath. She fainted in the water. So we had to take her out. I was going to call the ambulance. The pastor said, let's pray first. So we prayed and she came back. I said, do you want to be baptized? She said, yes. So we, I took her back in the water. Uh, so next one. So that's my village. That's actually where I was born. And they give me a gift of a, a, a roaster. <laughs> they presented it to me, and then they went, and they, and they killed it, and they cooked it. <laughs> Yeah, so I can see their faces, they are my neighbors, my people, we grew up together. Uh, it's wonderful to go back home, really wonderful. Next one, so this was one of the group, discipleship groups in other parts. As I said, I had 12 meetings. Next one. So some of the places, I will have them write the names of people who got saved. So that's the list. Next one. And I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, I was coming back home, you know, when I went, um, John took me all the way to Montreal. And then when I came back, 
the church paid, helped me from get a, play, um, a train from Montreal to Ottawa, and then Scott came to get me. So this is a work of the church, not just one person. But I thought I'll show you, because now we're going to start activities throughout the summer of fundraising. This mission, we're going to go to the refugee camp this year. There are over 60,000 people there, and we want to bring them some help, some clothes, some groceries. We will help as many as we can. We, are, we were counting, and we will hold also a leaders' conference for 100 people, feeding them and paying for their accommodation. It's going to take, do you remember the budget so far? She is the brains. <laughs> so it's a lot of money, but we, we need your help in terms of planning and doing activities for fundraising. So that's it. Um, prayer partners, we need uh, help in prayer. We have uh, ongoing um, like commitment. So uh, some of those numbers there and you get a, a charitable tax receipt when you donate. And uh, the, the our website is there, it's called orawatrwanda.org. All right, so. Morning, everyone. Um, he doesn't know I was gonna say this. So um, our legal name is Ottawa to Rwanda. Our operating name, which we're seeking to have it changed it to, um, knowing God's mission. So just for clarification, you're wondering, Otto to Rwanda, and then he's mentioning, so just for clarification. Another thing, reason why I could not answer you about the budget was my heart was really, as thinking about the spiritual impact. So as you know, Africa came to, a lot of the countries in Africa came to be because colonial rule and somebody said, these people belong here, these people belong here. Burundi, Rwanda, a lot of the people in Burundi, part of them ethnically, you'll see Rwandis who are, the culture is very similar, okay? So a lot of the war that has caused for there to be refugees in Rwanda stems from that. We, my heart was really about us, um, yes, money is needed. I believe God that he's gonna provide. He says, where, where I send you, I will resource you. We need to pray that the spirit of division that the rules and powers and dominions that cause these wars and cause homes and families to be split and literally running for their lives, for that to be broken. So please, please, when you're praying, please pray for all those countries that are facing wars and divisions and that God will keep Canada from that. We, yes, govern, good governance is part of it, but we should not fail to see God's hand behind it. Thank you. Amen. Okay. So we're going to dismiss the kids. And uh... <laughs> oh, oh. Give me a, go put your sweater on the chair, on the chair. All right. I was reading an article yesterday about the um, the genocide. There was an article yesterday, and they were saying that f that half a million people died. And in what they say, the sh in the shortest amount of time in history of mankind, it's insane. Uh, so we're gonna pray and dismiss the children. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your love upon these children that you love. And we are so blessed to have them here. And we thank you today that you open their hearts and their minds to receive what you want to teach them. I thank you, Lord, that, that you give them a heart to receive and, and to walk in your way and protect them from evil, O oh Lord. And thank you that you use them for your might and for your glory. I thank you that you protect also the teachers and that you impart upon them wisdom. Hallelujah. And Lord God, that your spirit is with them as they teach. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.
Praise God. So good to see everyone. Um, those, uh, there are some that we haven't had a chance to talk one-on-one. -on -one. I really can't wait to do that. I love getting to know people. Uh, it really fills me with joy. So, and uh, good to see some of you who have been kept coming back. And uh, good to see Pastor Blanche. Yeah. <laughs> so we are in a series that is going to take us a lifetime of studying the Bible. We're going to be going uh, verse by verse, and then we'll stop and talk about Easter, talk about Christmas, talk about other things, but we'll get back to where we stopped. So we had started with, in the beginning, the God, we spoke about in the beginning, we asked ourselves what it means. It's the, the eternality of God. God has no beginning. And then God, the world is Elohim, uh, created the heavens and the earth. And the heavens was, uh, the earth was empty and void. Darkness covering, we spoke about humility. Last, last time we looked at that, that you, you can see this darkness and emptiness everywhere. We need God. We have to humble ourselves. So there was darkness hovering, covering the whole, the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the deep. So. Now we are introduced for the first time to this person, or oh, power. I don't know what, what you believe about it. The spirit, who is he and what is it? So that's what I'm going to be looking at today, uh, the person of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to have time to look at the work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we will at some point. But today, I'm getting hot. I'm going to be talking about the person of the Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit a person or an influence? If he is a person, what kind of person is he? And what does he do? So, as a Christian, that is a, a powerful question to know. Is it, is it a it or is it a he or she? The Bible is very clear. Uh, on Friday, we were talking about this with the young adults. So someone who is always asking me hard questions, I want to point to you. <laughs> she said, why do you call it the Holy Spirit a he? It could be a she. You know, the, whole, the Bible says that, it's a he. So we want to have to ask the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible. He knows better. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. But is it just that? Is it a power? No, he's more than that. He's the illumination from God, the influence. But is he, is he just... To, this power, this illumination? No, the Holy Spirit is God himself. We worship, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. Therefore, he is a real person. I know you, some of you know it already, but do you really know it? We may believe it, but do we really believe it? That he is a person, a real, a real person. So there is a question for you. Is if the Holy Spirit is a power, then I can get hold of that power and use it for my own purposes. But if the Holy Spirit is a person, then he can get hold of me and use me. That is a huge difference. If your Holy Spirit is a power, then you're going to seek to use that power. And that's very wrong. 
And we see that in uh, so many denominations today. They are seeking the influence, the power that of the Holy Spirit, but they don't want to know the Holy Spirit. Two different things. There is a person, and there is his power. There is a person, and there is his anointing. There is a person, and there is his gifts. So do we seek only those things we can use for our purposes? Or do we seek to know him so he can use us? If your understanding of the Holy Spirit is just the power of God, then you will seek to possess that power so you, it can serve you for your own interests. And those interests, they may be biblical or not. But if your Sp Holy Spirit is a person, then you, you, you need to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So a born-again Christian is never alone, never. We are promised that the Holy Spirit will be with us to teach us when we pray. He's there praying with us. In fact, there are two who intercede for us. A believer has two divine persons interceding for them. The Holy Spirit intercedes for believers and Jesus intercedes for us. So we never go through trouble and uh, grief alone. He has prom The problem is that we're not aware of him being a person by our side. So who is the Holy Spirit? Who are you? Open our hearts to get a glimpse of your personhood. Breathe on us, that we may be enlightened, that we may know you. So, as we said, he is the person of the Son. He is the spirit of the Son. It's a, it's a mystery. I have to admit that. How can he be a spirit of the Son and yet be a separate person from the Son? It's the Trinity. Three who are one thing. Yet, separate. We say, this is a sentence, if you want to get a handle on the Trinity, you can remember this sentence. You can, we can distinguish, let's repeat that. We can distinguish, but we cannot separate. We distinguish the, between them, but we don't separate them. So, Galatians 4.6. Very, very good passage. It says, because you are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Because we belong to him, he has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. So he's the spirit of the son. Yet this, that verse shows us that he's more He's, he's, he's not just that. He says, the spirit who cries out. How can an influence cry out? How can just a power cry out? The spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. So he's a separate, a separate person that cries within a believer. So you can distinguish Christ from his spirit, but you cannot separate them because he is the spirit of the son. So being a spirit of another, you will be tempted to think of him just as an influence. But scripture teaches us over and over and over that he's a real living person, divine person. We have to distinguish this again. Uh, there are two, kind, two types of persons. There's a human person and there's a divine person. So what, a, what is a person? A person can be defined as a being, an individual with their own unique identity, consciousness, or a mind, but self-aware 
or self-conscious. Someone with ability to think, to feel, and to act. An influence doesn't have those things. Just an illumination from God is not that kind of being. So he is more than that. This is my assignment today, that you, go, you, you be honest with yourself and ask yourself, do I really believe that the Holy Spirit is a person? Here we are talking about the otherness of these two persons, the Son and the Spirit. He said in John 14, 16, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. And he may abide with you forever. So let's see some signs of his personhood. If, if he is a person, so these are some of the signs that we see in scripture. Knowledge. He has a knowledge. He knows. A power cannot, you cannot say the power knows. The influence knows things. 1 Corinthians 2.10, these are the things God has revealed by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows the person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So knowledge is ascribed to the spirit. The Holy Spirit has will, volition. And I want to say that he is willing. He's willing to help us. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11, it says this. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes these gifts to each one just as he wills, just as he determines. That's the will. The Holy Spirit is a person who chooses and say, okay, I'm going to give this gift to that one and this to that one. He distributes all these gifts as he determines. Not an influence only. The influence comes from a person, the person of the Spirit. We have to understand what today, especially charismatic people, we worship the presence, but we don't go one step further to worship the presence, the person whose that presence it is. I don't know if I'm using the right English. Let, let's take an example. If Carrie Ann uh, was not here, and we are worried, who is going to lead the worship? And we are all sitting here wondering who is going to sing. And she walks in. Everyone sees her. So the, her presence is here. We are all relieved. We can feel her presence. But there is still a person you can know or not know. And I'm afraid that's what happens in our churches. I was looking for songs to help me think about the Holy Spirit. It's all about the presence, all about the, the things he does, all about the anointing. What about the person? Sorry, Titus. <laughs> there is a person of the Holy Spirit. It's not just his presence and his anointing and his miracles. And if we don't know the person, I'm afraid we're just going to seek things we can use as opposed to the person who can use us. So he has a, a will. And he has a mind, as I was saying. Opinion, desire, choice. The Holy Spirit is a living person. Romans 8, 27 says, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. The mind of the Spirit. So I thought I would look at three things today. Who is he? His person. And then I look at his character. What kind of person is he? And if I have time, I will look at some of his work. 
So let's look at the character of the Holy Spirit. You're going to love him. You know, you know him, you love him. But my prayer is that we get even deeper revelation of the person of the Holy Spirit. What kind of person is he? Number one is that he loves. That is one character of the Holy Spirit. He is loving. I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit personal love for you. Romans chapter 15 verse 30. Romans 15 30. It says this. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. The love of the Spirit. To join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. So, Paul and all other uh, uh, apostles were aware of the love of the Holy Spirit. In fact, um, if you remember, there's something that really helped me in my growth is to understand that God's gifts and God himself, they are not two separate things. God is his love. God is his grace. God is his salvation. When we meet joy, there can be no other source of joy. If you feel joy, real joy, then Christ is nearby. Joy cannot come from anywhere else. So when we talk about love, the Holy Spirit is the love of God that is poured. Let's read that, Romans 5, 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. It says, now... Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by who? The Holy Spirit who was given us. So it's like God wants to pour his love. The Holy Spirit becomes the package that downloads that love into our hearts. And he is here day in, day out, to help us recognize and be aware of that love. So let me talk about, in practice, how that love is revealed to mankind. We go back now to that scripture in Genesis 1, verse 2. Uh, The earth was empty and void, dark. Any, Any word you can find that describes chaos. And the Spirit of God, Genesis 1-2, was hovering over the deep. That word hovering is the word of, it's it's also, you can call it uh, brooding. It's what the the chicken uses, when the chicken uh, is laying over her eggs, waiting for the eggs to be ready. The chicken hovers. The Holy Spirit was hovering over uncreated matter, waiting. That's that's the first time we see the love of the Holy Spirit towards creation. Even before creation was in existence, the Holy Spirit was there, hovering. You know, always think of him as a person, and there is something that shows that he's there. So some of the things that we use is the wind. The word there in Genesis 1-2 is a ruach, which means wind. He was hovering like a chicken waiting for creation to be ready. You start to see that his love. He's the person in the Godhead who undertakes to come and wait for uncreated matter until it's created. Now, we continue. God creates us, we mess up, but the Holy Spirit does not leave. uh, You can read with me Genesis 6, chapter 3. Genesis 6, 3. The Father is speaking, and the Spirit has not left mankind. He is still with us, trying to convince us, trying to work with us wrestling with people, trying to show them what is right until the father says, enough is enough. 
is what he says. My spirit will not contend with humans forever. It shows that the person of the Holy Spirit had not left the earth, had continued to work with humans, wrestling and, uh, and contending. They are mortal, their days will be 120. He's there hovering over unformed creation. He's there trying to work with people after the fall. And then with, after Jesus had come and people have the cross and the grace available to us, who is it that helps a believer to know God? The Holy Spirit, you know? I think of him when I was yet an unbeliever, far from God. Yeah, he is right there, patiently hovering, hovering. I think of him trying to introduce some thoughts in my mind. Even you may be here and you're not really a born again believer, you can be sure he's by your side, trying to make you know, his gentle, try to help you to understand the things of God. I was praying the other day downstairs in the office, and I saw a picture of families around here. Nice families, husband, wife, kids, doing their best to be good people. Yet they are faced with the impossible task of living this life. There's troubles in families. And I was praying for them. I could sense the Holy Spirit is there, trying to show them what to do. So the Holy Spirit is there waiting with non-Christians, trying to convince them of sin. And when you start to open your heart a little bit, he comes in. And he now started to reveal Jesus. There are three, I found three beautiful levels of, of testimony that the Holy Spirit does to, the world, to, to us. He goes to non-Christians and he testifies to them of sin. He says, what you're doing is wrong. And they block their ears, they don't want to hear it. But he testifies. And then he comes to those who have received Jesus, and he testifies of their sonship. The Bible says, because we are God's children, we have the spirit of the Son with us, who confirms that we are God's children. You see, these are the words that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So within you, you may not really know that he's a person, but you know that there is someone there who is always saying, you belong, you belong, you belong. It's true, yes. And then when we turn around and now we are going to Africa to preach, the Holy Spirit is the one who goes with us and enables people. He gives power to the words. He gives power to simple words we say, and people can be saved. When I, last, last month I was in Kenya and I wanted to preach to, in this church, I preached the gospel, and seven young men stood up to receive Jesus. I prayed for them to come home. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So what kind of person is he? Loving, patient, patient with the world, patient with the repenting people, patient with us after we repent. Do you know that he's there watching every sin we commit? But Jesus said, he will abide with you forever. 
we have to make a distinction. His anointing can live. But if you believe in Jesus, those who do not have the Spirit of God, they are none of His. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you are not a Christian. Okay, so um, another aspect of his, his character is something that I see in loving relationships. Wherever there is loving relationships, you will find there is also what I can call jealousy. Or we take things personally if we are in loving relationship. I cannot just say anything to my wife. She will take it personally. The Holy Spirit is like that. With that kind of investment he has made in our lives, he, he expects things. And when we start behaving anyhow, he takes it, he takes it very personally. That is a part of his behavior and personality that we need to know. I'm going to read for you a few scriptures. Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. Any act of disobedience it breaks his heart. He says, but I love you. It's a real person. Can you grieve a power? Can you grieve an influence? An illumination just to help you understand the scripture? He is a real living person of the Trinity. Isaiah 63 verse 10 says, Yet they rebelled against and grieved his spirit. They did. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29. I don't know if you're going to keep up. Keep trying. Hebrews 10 29, it says, uh, this is a very scary scripture. Some people take stands about um, you know, there are doctrines that Christians don't see eye to eye. But for me, I'm very careful. Because if the Bible says this, and then I keep reading, I find something else, then you have to be humble. This is one thing, read, listen to this. It's talking about those who break the heart of God and um, they crucified Christ again. Hebrews 10, 29, how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God? So you have trampled Jesus. Who has treated as unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them? And then underline this one. Who has insulted the spirit of grace? Insulting the spirit of grace. And we are not talking about big sins like adultery, killing. He expects holiness. He expects purity. Because he offers it. He, we have no other source of purity. It's him we drink from. If you are willing, he will help you. Rise from the shackles. He will help you rise from the lies. If you are willing, the spirit of the living God will help you. Every lie we entertain or every unclean or untruth that comes out of our mouth, it insults him. Because he is there to help us. You, we have a choice. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, it says, uh, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Can you lie to an influence? Can you lie to a power? So really try to, even if your brain does not get it, but look at these scriptures. And take them home with you. 
He is a real living person. So this is the story of Ananias, Ananias and his wife. They, in those days, the disciples used to sell the property and bring the money in the church to help the poor. And this couple wanted to keep some money to themselves. And they still wanted to be honored in the front of everybody that they have done a good job and they have given all, all their money. And Peter, with a person with him, invisible person, but who sees in the heart. Peter asked, is this all the money you received? They say, yes. Peter said, you're not lying to me. You're lying to the person of the spirit. And it was serious that that man died right there. Even his wife died. So we have to have a sense of reverence for the Holy Spirit. You know, some cultures, they, they entertain lies. I when I came to the West, I found that um, people teach their kids not to tell lies. And then later, they find a way of legalizing lies. And we have lawyers who will help us to, to make lies legal. So, um, but it's still the same thing. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31, it says, this, and so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven you. So I want to emphasize that he is a person separate from the Son. And you can get to know him. Now, what are the, some of the things that he does that we can learn and get to know uh, slowly? He teaches. The Holy Spirit teaches. When you read your Bible, there was a man called uh, George Whitfield. Has anyone heard of George Whitfield? Yes, some of you. He was an evangelist um, in the I think 1600, 1700. He brought what we know as the Great Awakening in the United States. It was George Whitfield um, preaching, but he said that he never read the Bible standing up that he used to read the Bible like this. You see what this says? He is aware that there is a teacher. A teacher can help him see things. There is a teacher who can show him the truth. And uh, he will read prayerfully. Do not read the Bible alone. Don't. Be aware of the living spirit. He inspired the scriptures. He can help you understand them. We need just not to know the scriptures, but we need to believe and obey them. So the Holy Spirit teaches us. As you approach scripture, let there be reverence to, for the author of scripture. So don't read the Bible alone. Let the Holy Spirit teach you what it means. David will say, show me wonderful things in your law, O Lord. As you read the Bible with the Holy Spirit there with you, open your heart to, for the Holy Spirit to speak. Sometimes I read and read and then stop. I can start shouting and dancing around because I feel something alive has come to me. He teaches, John 15, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all, all all things and will remind you of everything I say to you. And this is not just about religious things. He can give you wisdom in life. 
He can teach you how not to spend all that money. <laughs> how not to eat all that. I used to eat big muffins. Oh, even when I think about it, I want one. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can help us with self-control. You re we really need to, to get the help from God. If you need help in behavior, everyday behavior, be aware of the personal presence of God in the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 12 he says, I have much to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will speak not on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it's, it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So if, if in your mind you start getting confusion, you know, the young people were asking me, why have the Father and the Son and then the Spirit? It's a little too much. Just remember, he is the Spirit of God. If you're seeing him, he's not a separate thing. He's the Spirit of God. This is how Christ rests with us, by his Spirit. He might be a separate person that is difficult to understand, but he remains the Spirit of the Son. And the Father. Nehemiah 9.20, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. He teaches us. You did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and you gave them water for their thirst. 1 John 2.20, 1 John 2.20, it says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. The anointing is that unction that from the Holy Spirit. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Verse 27, in 1 John chapter 2, as for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not fake, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. And this is the problem we have, is that we are seeking the counterfeit. If we don't seek the person in the scriptures, we're going to be lost. We're going to seek what's not real. If you only seek miracles, as opposed to seeking the miracle worker, then you're going to get the counterfeit. You won't be able to, to distinguish. You know what is beautiful about the, the, this God? Uh, today, this morning, I went to Arawa River. I was praying. I read Acts 1 and 2, 3 and 4. And I was listening how Whenever they will pray to the Father to give them boldness, to give them miracles, <clears throat> to give them Christ, say, say, let miracles be done in the name of your Son. Give us boldness to preach the gospel. What happens? They become full of the Holy Spirit. You are praying to know God for the gospel. What is the result? You are full of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes, what does he do? He teaches Christ. When they are full of the Holy Spirit, Peter on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, what does he do? He says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you have crucified, is the Messiah. So that is the beauty of this, that we really need to stay in scriptures in order to have the real thing. So, he teaches, number two, he prays. He prays with those who pray. And he prays for us. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, he says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know 
what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. In your prayer time, are you aware of the Holy Spirit praying with you? When you have difficult things in front of you, thick, thick situations, you can just be silent. He will pray. He will intercede for you. Galatians 4, 6, it says, Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out. He prays, Abba, Father. So my prayer for you is that from now on, you don't read the Bible alone, and you don't pray alone. Always retain that conscious awareness of the living personal presence of God with you. <clears throat> he leads, so we saw that he teaches, he prays, but also he leads. I want to encourage you today, do not lose confidence you have in the Holy Spirit. Do not let anyone shake you from having confidence in the Holy Spirit. He can guide you, he can lead you. Romans 8, 14, it says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Otherwise, you're going to be lost. In uh, Acts chapter 6, verse, chapter 16, verse 6 and 7, I find them a, a really, really powerful passage. Do you know the Holy Spirit can guide you? Can guide your decisions? Can, can show you, don't go there, go there. Don't do that, do that. And if we don't preach this, we start to lose confidence. You start to think, oh, am I hearing things? Am I losing my mind? Listen to this. Do we respect Paul, the apostle? Do we think he was a heretic? No. So we agree with Paul. In Acts 16, verse 7, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by who? The Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So this is a preacher who has planned, who has raised the funds, who has all his missionaries with him. And as they are about to go in the province of Asia, the Holy Spirit says no. Don't lose confidence in the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life. Hold on to it. Verse 7, when they came to, to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bethania, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. This is a living person. It's not just some power that helps us to pray for the sick some influence that enables us to preach. He would say to them, no, I have other thoughts. And by the way, it was to go to prison. <laughs> because they kept going and they ended up in prison. So lastly, oh, the one before last. <laughs> he calls and he ordains. Do you believe it's the Holy Spirit who calls workers in the kingdom of God? Last, before I went to Africa, we presented the elders here, or those who are going to be trained that they can serve us as our elders. But hopefully, prayerfully, that was not my choice. It was the Holy Spirit. Listen to Acts 13, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, wow, it's not the influence that said, it's not some power, some illumination. He said this, he said, set apart from, for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to do. So he wanted them, he called them, he made people know about it, and then 
They said, them, let them go. And look, listen to this about um, the elders, the um, ordaining of elders in the church. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, Acts 20, 28. This is Paul again talking to elders. He said to them, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. It's good as an overseer or as an elder or as a leader to know it's the Holy Spirit who has given that to you. Be shepherds of, of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Lastly, he comforts us. He's a comforter. I know at least a few families in this church that are going through difficulties. Really, really tough times. May the Holy Spirit comfort you. I want you to imagine the disciples. For, the, for three years, they had been with Jesus. Every day, he, he was their friend. He would teach them. He would guide them. Sometimes he would reveal his divinity to them. <clears throat> they had a, someone comforting them. And then all of a sudden, he started to say, that I'm going to die. And I'm not gonna, you're not going to see me. I'm going. They are <clears throat> broken. And he looks in the eyes, he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. There is someone who is now with you, but he's going to be in you. And he says, when the comforter comes, he, he called him another helper. So someone just like him will come to comfort them. Imagine everything that Jesus was for the disciples, the Holy Spirit is for us, or want to be for us today. So he, Jesus, he could not stay in a human body. But ever since the day of Pentecost, Pentecost, Jesus, by his spirit, he is now in believers, comforting, teaching, guiding. So whenever you feel lost, <clears throat> ask yourself, do I believe in the personal Holy Spirit? Is he with me? And then let him comfort you. So to finish my message today, I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Do you know him? Do you know his communion? There are words we like to say. We say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship or communion of the Holy Spirit be with us. Be honest with yourself. Do you know that communion. <clears throat> and if you don't, just say a little prayer of repentance right now. Say with me, Holy Spirit, thank you for your love, for your patience. Even when I fall, Thank you for being there. Help me not to ignore you any longer. Wake me up to your personal presence. Let me be aware of you. <clears throat> Open the eyes of my heart that I may see you. Let me enjoy your presence. Let me benefit from your fellowship. May, uh, let's, let's, actually, let's stand if you don't mind. If you are able to stand. Repeat this. Now, may the God of hope fill me 
with all joy and peace in believing that I may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, as uh, we just like to remind you that we have things going on throughout the week. Every morning at 6 a.m., we read the Bible. And uh, we meet on Zoom. You can sign in, and everyone can follow. And on Thursdays, we come here for Bible study and prayer. In the evening, now it's summer, there is some sun, you can drive. And on Friday at 10 a.m., we come during the day and we pray. We allow the Holy Spirit to work. And uh, we have other things that you can, if you don't, you receive our emails, you can get uh, those uh, notifications. But right now, if there's someone who would like to receive prayer and you feel like you have severed, you have stopped that union with the Holy Spirit, and you like to be restored to that, come here for prayer. And uh, I will pray with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>